Hello, my name is Dr. Bill Hessman. I'm a practicing veterinarian from Southwest Kansas. My practice lies right in the heart of the cattle feeding industry and through my work in the feed yard I became interested in bovine viral diarrhea virus. Since that time we've conducted multiple research studies and published many of these in scientific journals looking at the effect that BVD will have in cattle populations. In this presentation, I want to cover the basics of BVD virus. We'll talk about the virus itself, uh, how cattle populations can behave when BVD virus is introduced, and things that you can do as a producer to minimize the effects. We're going to cover the basics of uh, bovine viral diarrhea virus in this presentation. BVD virus is considered to be one of the most costly viral diseases we see in cattle worldwide. We originally isolated uh, BVD virus in upstate New York in 1946, and in that clinical presentation it was described as causing a severe diarrhea, hence we get the name bovine viral diarrhea. We know it causes high morbidity and high mortality. Uh, we later found out it uh, causes a lot of reproductive diseases in cattle, and we also now know that it is one of the leading causes of respiratory disease. One of the most important parts of BVD virus is the fact that it produces what we call persistently infected animals, or PI animals. A little bit about the virus itself. Uh, BVD virus is a highly mutagenic virus, meaning that it changes frequently. With about every viral replication, it changes, so potentially we have an infinite number of strains. We, we have it classified into genotypes, and in the U.S. we see two genotypes, type 1 and type 2, and these are further subdivided into what we call subtypes. There are four subtypes uh, in the U.S. Type 1, we see 1A and 1B. Type 2, we see type 2A and 2B. Okay, a little bit about BVD infections. Uh, there are two infections that we see caused by BVD. One is called persistent infection, or PI. The other is called acute infection. We'll talk briefly about a PI animal. They're only born PI. They do not develop after birth, only during gestation. These animals are unique in that they have absolutely no immune response against bovine viral diarrhea virus. They shed very high levels of the virus every day as long as they're alive. They show no sickness to the virus that they are carrying. They shed the virus continually. These animals do have a greater tendency for mortality. That's the PI infection. Acute infection, also called transient infection, is much like you or I would get influenza virus. We catch the infection and this occurs after birth. It's transient, meaning it doesn't last very long. Once you catch it, the, the body builds an immune response against it and uh, clears it from the body. It's there for about seven to 14 days. These animals seldom show signs of sickness. Uh, an acutely infected animal will shed virus for about one week before the immune system clears it, and the level of shed uh, in an acutely infected animal is much less than what we see in PI animals, and we'll show you data on that later. One of the biggest myths that we deal with is that you can visually look and tell an animal is PI. The animal you're seeing here was persistently infected, but we very seldom see an animal that looks like this. Most of the times they look perfectly normal. So you cannot visually recognize a PI animal. Source of bovine viral diarrhea virus outbreaks. The most common source and the reservoir for continuation of bovine viral diarrhea is direct contact with the persistently infected animal. That is the main source or reservoir for transmission amongst herds and between uh, generations. They can also transmit it from an acutely infected animal, but not near to the degree that the PI transmits it. Indirect means of transmission, uh, any of the equipment we use when we handle our calves can spread the virus to the cattle. And there is also um, infected wildlife that can carry it to spread it to cattle. These are just a few of the published uh, scientific uh, papers that 
look at the economic cost uh, from BVD in, in cattle. Many of them are dairy. Uh, we have some cow-calf uh, feed yard and start yard. If you look at the costs that are incurred, it's usually some from about $10 per head up to about $88 per head. I want you to keep in mind that most of these studies were done 10 to 20 years ago. So the impact that's reported here is probably uh, less than what you would see today. BVD causes subclinical disease. This is important to understand. Um, subclinical means absence of clinical signs. The animal has the infectious disease, but he's not showing any outward signs to show you that he's infected. Studies have shown that BVD uh, is subclinical somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the time. The virus is there causing problems, but you don't recognize the animal as being sick. Uh, another article by Mowerman back in 94, acute BVD infection in large dairy. In this study, it showed that 95% of the times the animal were harboring the virus but showed no clinical signs of illness. So BVD most of the time is subclinical. It just robs you out of the background. You don't know that it's going on. We talked about uh, the persistently infected animal and the acutely infected animal. The persistent infection is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, BVD is much bigger and much broader as you would expect with an iceberg. PIs are the tip of the problem. Um, they are the carriers of the disease acting as reservoirs between different generations and groups of, of cattle. And the impact of these carriers can limit every aspect of uh, production. But the PI animals are not the expensive part. It's the effect that this persistently infected animal has on the others. And it encompasses all aspects of production. From reproduction, it can cause conception uh, issues, abortion, stillbirth, increased calving intervals, decreased weaning weights. Uh, we see an increase in sickness rate when there's a PI in, the, in a group. Um, bovine respiratory disease, mastitis, retained placentas, uh, mortality increases uh, in the feedlots. We see uh, reduced performance in the animals that are exposed to PIs. Uh, cost of gain uh, increases. Milk production will go down. Uh, we also know that it will affect the carcass traits in, in the feed yard industry. Let's talk a little bit about bovine viral diarrhea virus and BRD or bovine respiratory disease. We know that bovine viral diarrhea can damage the lung directly, so it can cause pneumonia. But more importantly, the virus is very immunosuppressive, and so it will suppress the immune system of the animal and act as a catalyst for all the other pathogens that are normally there, but not a problem, to now be a bigger problem. So the biggest impact we see from bovine viral diarrhea is immunosuppression in the animal, allowing the common pathogens to cause more problems. This is a classic example of an animal in the feed yard when we did a post-mortem, and this is a uh, picture of the animal's lungs, and you can see that there's considerable amount of pneumonia in this animal. He died from bovine respiratory disease. And had I just stopped the post-mortem examination at this point, we would have said, well, he's just got uh, pneumonia. Um, that's why he died. But if you look further, this picture here is a picture of the fourth stomach or abomasin. And these are lesions that we see uh, when we have acute BVD, these ulcers in the abomasin. This picture here is a picture of an esophagus. And you can see the multiple erosions on the lining of the esophagus. This is BVD. So BVD came in, caused these problems, suppressed the animal's immune system, and allowed the animal to get a, uh, a bad uh, bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia. We didn't see any signs or symptoms of BVD. The animal was treated for pneumonia. So the BVD came in, suppressed the immune system, allowed the pneumonia to get this bad. Let's talk a little bit about how BVD increases uh, respiratory disease in cattle. Uh, this is a study by Dr. Leo Potgeiter, and what uh, Dr. Potgeiter did was took a group of calves and put them in three groups. The first group he just exposed to BVD virus without follow-up exposure to the bacteria that caused pneumonia. And in this group of calves, when he did uh, post-mortem examination, 2 to 7% of the lung field was pneumonic. Uh, 
In the second group of calves, he only exposed to the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia in calves, and upon examination, 15% of the lung field became pneumonic. In the third group, he exposed to BVD virus, and then followed that with an exposure to the most common bacterial component of respiratory disease, and in this group of calves, between 40 and 75% of the lung field became pneumonic. This really illustrates how BVD can be subclinical, um, but it immunosuppresses the animal, allowing for more severe uh, pneumonia diseases. BVD, as we talked about, is very immunosuppressive. Uh, it's the immune suppression that allows for uh, the common pathogens to cause a greater problem, such as bovine respiratory disease, joint infections, uh, mastitis, uh, retained placentas, and foot rot. The, effect, the, the effects of BVD are usually hard to recognize. We talk about how most of the time it's subclinical and just robbing you in the background, but every once in a while it'll, it'll reach out and slap you upside the head. This is a, uh, from a paper that we published back in 2008 about uh, BVD and the effect in the feed yard. Uh, cattle arrived, uh, there was a type 2A in, in these cattle that came with the PI. Uh, very aggressive strain, uh, very naive cattle, and it wound up causing 40% mortality in this pen of cattle, and we treated 100% of the calves. These animals were vaccinated uh, with a BVD type 1 and type 2 vaccine uh, on arrival and then revaccinated three times in an attempt to get ahead of it. When we calculated the cost of this virus in this pen of cattle, it turned out to cost $437 per head. So this is one of those examples where it really reached out and uh, was quite painful. I call this the great BVD wreck of 93 to 95. This occurred in Canada in dairy herds. There were seven herds that were affected, um, wound up with an abortion rate of 44%. The mortality rate was 25% in these dairies. They did isolate a type two uh, BVD virus out of this break and at the time, there were no two type 2 vaccines. Uh, we now have type 2 in our vaccines. Economic impact was somewhere between forty dollars and $100,000 loss per dairy herd. Uh, this is in a herd. Uh, producer had 235 cows. This particular year, he only weaned 176 calves. And because of the issues, he decided to test for BVD and PIs, and uh, they found 46 of the calves were PI, and all those PI calves died. Um, we know that the exposure to this gentleman's herd came from uh, the neighbor uh, that was grazing yearlings in an adjacent pasture, so that was the source of exposure. Uh, there were three PIs in that yearling group, which served as the reservoir, the source to infect this gentleman's herd. Economic impact was $312 per cow. A classic BVD wreck. We don't see these very often. Most of the time, it's just that subtle robbing that lays in the background that's hard to recognize, but every once in a while, you'll have one of these wrecks. And I describe the BVD wreck as when groups of animals without immunity meet PI animals at inopportune times. Talk a little more about the virus itself. Uh, the effect of BVD virus in the cow is all about the timing, and I'll explain more about that. There will be different outcomes of the calf based upon the timing of exposure to the cow and hence the fetus. If the cow gets exposed to the virus in the early part of gestation, uh, it appears to be a conception problem in the herd. First thought is maybe the bull didn't do his job, something, but it, it can be because the, the, the reproductive herd had exposure to the virus uh, at the time you turned the bulls out, and it looks like a conception problem. If that exposure occurs between about day 40 and 125, this is the time frame when we produce PI calves. Um, if the dam gets exposed to the virus, it will cross over uh, the placenta into the fetus. And this is a critical time in that stage of gestation when the fetus is recognizing what is part of itself. They do that so when they're born, they can defend against anything that's not self. 
And so if the virus is there, when the immune system is recognizing self, it'll say, this is my hair, this is my hooves, this is my heart, this is my BVD virus. And therefore, the calf will never ever mount an immune response against what is self. And if BVD virus is there, it considers that part of itself. So this calf is born um, shedding huge quantities of BVD virus all his life. If that exposure occurs a little later in gestation, you tend to get congenital defects. Um, calves that are infected in the last part of gestation can be born alive but weak and often die after birth. And then of course we can see abortion anytime throughout uh, the gestation period. Let's talk a little more about the development of the PI calf. It's a calf that's born with the virus and has the infection all its life, and they are only born PI. They don't become PI after birth. As we said, it's when the, the mother's exposed to the virus from day one or day 40 to 120. The calf is born and it sheds the virus all its life. We know from studies that 7% of the persistently infected calves are born to cows that are PI. Even though I told you that the mortality of the PI animal is much greater, uh, some of them do reach a mature age and actually make it back into our herds. So 7% of PI calves are born to cows that are PI themselves. Graphically, uh, if you have a PI cow, every calf she has is going to be persistently infected. And this occurs about 7% of the time. What happens more often is that you have a clean cow uh, that is in the proper stage of gestation and she gets exposed to the virus and then she will produce a persistently infected calf. Vaccination only helps slow BBD virus and we need to talk about this a little. Um, most of you vaccinate your herds for BBD but uh, we know from studies that vaccines will not completely prevent it. It only helps reduce the chance of, of having an issue. Uh, it's my opinion that we have less than adequate vaccine cross protection, and I'll explain that a little bit. Currently, the modified live vaccines we have contain type 1A and 2A. Through our research, what we have found is that the most common strain we see in the field in PI animals is type 1B. So we do not have the correct strain in our vaccines uh, to immunize against the most common subtype we see in the field. Earlier we talked about BVD being highly mutagenic, means it's always changing. So this virus is always moving away from the strains we use in our vaccine. Uh, so our vaccines haven't kept up with the changes we've seen in the virus. And the final thing is the level of challenge posed by the PI animal. And we'll talk about that uh, in greater length in a few slides. I talked about uh, cross-neutralizing antibodies, and, and this to me is very important. Um, we, we talked about our vaccines containing type 1A and type 2A. And these are vaccine titers, animals that were vaccinated with two doses, and then we see what level of protection they have. And a titer is illustrated by a number. The greater the number, the greater the level of protection. So here we've got a really good level of protection and much less in this animal for type 2A and for 1A. Our vaccines contain 1A and 2A. And if you look at the level of protection produced by our current vaccines, you can see that the 1B protection is much less than what we see with uh, the 1A or 2A. This is exactly why we need to develop a vaccine that contains the 1B so we can uh, produce better immunity against the most common strain we see in PI animals. This is a slide that illustrates um, our work looking at uh, what strain is most common. Uh, we started this work in 2004 and we continued it uh, till uh, 2008. And we would genotype every strain that we found in PI animals. And if you just look at the totals here, uh, 1A constituted about 12%, uh, 2A approximately 10%, and 78% of the time, um, the subtype that we found in PI animals was 1B. And so we need to develop a vaccine that contains this antigen in there so we can provide better immunity. Our current vaccines don't do a bad job, but they can do better. I talked about level of challenge posed by the PI animal. Let's look at the difference between an acutely infected animal and a persistently infected animal. 
This is an acutely infected animal, and this animal will shed virus particles somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 virus particles per mil of nasal secretion for just a little more than a week. Then the immune system responses and responds and takes care of, of the infection. Let's compare that to the level of challenge posed by a PI animal. We have done virus titrations in PI animals, and what we find is that they will carry somewhere between 1 million and a billion virus particles per ml of nasal secretion, and they do this for as long as they're alive. How vaccines can uh, reduce the effects. If you've got an acutely infected animal shedding 100,000 virus particles, an animal with poor immunity uh, may very likely to uh, succumb to the effects of the exposure. Those with good immunity um, may do fine. Let's compare that level of challenge of a PI animal and the effect on vaccinated animals. Uh, the level of challenge is much greater, somewhere between 1 million and 1 billion virus particles per cc daily, as long as the animal's alive. Of course, the animal with poor immunity is uh, not going to do well, but because of the duration and the magnitude of uh, the exposure, a lot of the animals that have a decent or good immunity may also succumb to the challenge. Economic analysis of BVD studies in the feed yard. We've done two studies in the feed yard looking at the impact that PIs have on the feeding population. In the first study, based upon the cost of gain and the purchase cost of the mortalities, we found that if there was a PI in the pen, it cost everybody in that pen $47 per head throughout the feeding period. We followed this study up with a much larger study, and when we looked at the cost, we looked at the cost per head in exposed pens not only the pen that contained the PI, but the adjacent pens as well, because they would have been exposed through across the fence exposure. And in the second study, we found that the cost was $67 for every animal uh, that had exposure. If you prorate that over the total population, uh, it cost $41 for every animal in the feed yard. So the cost is, is dramatic when you have a B, uh, BVD PI animal in a group of cattle in the feed yard. A little bit about the economics of uh, testing for identifying the PI and removing him out. Is there any value to identifying that PI on arrival and getting that exposure out of the uh, general population? And this data shows that, again, if we look at the cost of gain difference and the mortality difference, that uh, if you tested and removed those PIs as soon as you could after arrival at the backgrounding yard or the feed yard, it would return about $21 of that $67 cost. Keep in mind that this is based on uh, numbers from 2004. So in today's dollars, it's likely to be much greater than, than the $21. Herd testing. This is important for the cow-calf man. First of all, you need to know the status of your herd. And to, it, to know whether or not you have uh, BBD in your herd, it's most effective to test the calves. If you test all the calves and they are negative, then we know that the cows are negative. If you happen to find a positive calf, then you have to go back and test the cow to see what her status is. 7% of the time these PI calves come from a PI cow. Most of the time they're, they're clean and just have had exposure. So test all the calves and any calf that shows positive, go back and test that cow. Also, test any cow that did not produce you a calf or lost a calf. Also, test the bulls. If all tests negative, your herd is BVD free. The important part here is BVD free for that year. The next year, uh, your adults will all remain negative because once negative, always negative, but you do not know anything about the next year's calf crop. There are many tests available to test for BBD. Uh, we'll go over some of these briefly and describe a little bit about them. IHC is called immunohistochemistry. It has an excellent accuracy. It does take about a week um, to nine days to get test results. Costs somewhere between $350 and $7. ACE test or antigen capture ELISA has excellent accuracy also. It's a much quicker test. You can get results in less than 24 hours, and the cost ranges from about $250 to $7. PCR is our newest 
testing methodology. It's called pol polymerase chain reaction. Uh, I will show you some studies, and we've done a lot of work to show that the results of PCR can be questionable. It's a rapid test as well, less than 24 hours, and, and quite variable in the cost, somewhere between two and twenty dollars. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the oldest test that we've used is called virus isolation. Uh, it also has questionable results, but more importantly, it takes a long time to get results, seven to ten days, and it is expensive. It also requires two tests about 14 days apart in order to verify whether an animal is PI or not. I'm going to talk briefly just about pooling of samples. Um, most labs today are doing uh, something called pooling, and that's where you group many animals in one test. Um, and the purpose of doing this, if the test is negative, you don't have to go any further. And because we don't find a whole lot, it is economically advantageous from a test standpoint to pool animals together, and if they're negative, you're done. As compared to testing each animal individually in each test. BVD, because it has a low prevalence, uh, we find a small amount that are PI positive, uh, most of the pools test negative. If that pool or group of animals in one test tests positive, then you have to test each of those animals individually out of the positive pool. Uh, the pooling does decrease, decrease the cost of testing for the lab and possibly the producer. The problem is uh, we decrease the accuracy of PCR or any testing methodology when we pool. And I'll show you several studies that will explain that. This is a study, study out of Auburn University by Misty Edmondson, um, and uh, they just sent identical samples to 23 different diagnostic labs across the United States and had them run whatever the standard lab protocol was to diagnose BBD. With IHC, um, they found 90% of them positive correctly, 10% false negative. 2% uh, false positive here. The antigen capture ELISA test was 100% accurate, finding positive positives and negative negatives. PCR was a little weaker, only 85% accurate, finding the positives positive. And virus isolation was only at 69% identifying the PI animals. This is another study that we were involved with looking at uh, PCR technology as compared to antigen capture ELISA and also evaluating uh, testing the samples as single samples or in pools of 10. The outcomes here show that PCR, even as singles, only gave us an accuracy of 78% and got much worse when we pooled them and the accuracy went to 39%. With antigen capture ELISA, it proved to be 100% accurate when we did them as singles, but the accuracy did drop to 85% when the samples were pooled. Yet another study that we were involved with, um, this, all these tests were run as single skin samples. Um, with PCR, um, what we found was it was accurate 83% of the time, and with the antigen capture ELISA, it was 100% accurate. This is a uh, public that was studied, uh, published by Dr. Brendan Krauss comparing a laboratory that used pooled PCR testing with single tested antigen capture ELISA. Uh, duplicate samples were sent to two different labs, one running PCR in pools, one using the antigen capture ELISA test as single. The outcomes showed that PCR tests failed to detect 67% of the PI calves. One more study uh, just recently published comparing uh, or looking at or evaluating uh, PCR technology. Dr. Dan Grooms at Michigan State uh, was conducting uh, BBD PI studies on several groups of cattle. In fact, there were three studies uh, in this publication. In one study, the pooled PCR misidentified eight animals as not PI, so only had an accuracy of 50%. And in this situation, they were pooling 10 head in one test. So finally about PCR testing. We have evaluated multiple PCR tests and we have yet to find one in our hands that is accurate. Uh, we did research with a company called Applied Biosystem and we found a naturally occurring inhibiting substance that would 
provide false negative outcomes and it made no difference whether we did them as singles or in pools. So I question the accuracy and the value of using PCR testing for uh, trying to identify and remove PI animals. ACE testing, we find this to be the most robust and accurate test. Um, we also know that there are inhibitors in antigen capture ELISA tests that can provide false negative outcomes and this occurs when samples are pooled together. 4% uh, of negative animals have the ability to inhibit a positive sample. And so if you look at the probability statement where uh, the prevalence rate of PIs is 0.4% and 4% of the negative animals uh, have the inhibiting ability and we group seven samples in one test, we would decrease the accuracy of identifying PIs by 15%. Pooling samples, and it doesn't make any difference whether it's PCR or ACE, will decrease uh, the accuracy of the outcomes. And while cost effective for the lab, is not cost effective for the producer. And any false negative outcome will remove the economic benefit of testing and removing. At CST, we do not pool because of the inaccuracies. We do use the antigen capture ELISA test. It's important that if you are testing, that you ask your lab whether they're pooling samples or not. It's better to spend a little more money and get an accurate outcome than to have a false negative, removing the benefit of uh, your testing program. Pooling will decrease accuracy. Systematic management of BVD virus. Uh, first of all, know your current herd status. And the only way you're gonna know that is to uh, test, identify, and remove any of those PI animals, and we recommend you do that with antigen capture ELISA testing. And again, test the calf crop. If the calf crop is negative, your adults are negative. If you have a calf that's positive, go back and test the dam. Test any adult that did not provide you with a calf, and don't forget the bulls. Uh, number two is make sure that you don't have any more PIs in your, in your breeding herd. So if you're bringing animals into your herd, have them tested prior to putting them with your herd. It's also important to know that uh, while we can test the status of the cow, we do not have any idea about the fetus that, that she's carrying. So test the heifer uh, and test the newborn calf as soon as it's born. Step three is protect naive, naive animals, and we do that through vaccinations and appropriate vaccinations. And the final step is uh, be sure and implement appropriate biosecurity strategies and uh, an ongoing surveillance program to make sure it doesn't enter your herd. Uh, this is the program where you do nothing. It's just putting your head in the sand. And if you do this long enough, BVD will come and get your attention. Central States testing, as I said, we do the uh, ear, ear notch testing. We use the antigen capture ELISA test. Uh, our testing starts at $3.15 a sample. We also do blood pregnancy testing as well. I hope that you found some value in the presentation we provided. If you have any questions about BVD in your particular operation, you can feel free to call us at Central States testing and we would be glad to answer any questions that you may have.